morning. Good morning. Will we please stand for the reading of God's word? And would the choir please come forward? We'll be reading out of Jonah. Jonah chapter 4, 6 through 11. Jonah chapter 4. It says, And the Lord God prepared a plant and made it come up over Jonah, that it might be shaped for his head to deliver him from his misery. So Jonah was very grateful for the plant. But as morning dawned the next day, God uh, prepared a worm, and so damaged the plant that it withered. And it happened when the sun arose that God prepared a vehement east wind, and the sun beat on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. Then he wished death for himself, and said, It is better for me to die than to live. Then God said to Jonah, Is it right for you to be angry about the plant? said, Is it right for me to be angry even to death? But the Lord said, You have had pity on the plant for which you had not labored, nor made it grow, which came up in the night and perished in, in, not, uh, perished in the night. And should I not pity Nineveh, the, that great city, in which are more than 120,000 persons who cannot discern between their right hand and their left, and much livestock. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you that you are a God of mercy. And way before your mercy came holiness. And, and, and we thank you, Lord God, that that you are all that you are. For we are not much compared to you. And yet, Lord, you still look upon us and have mercy upon us. We thank you, Lord, that, that you have called us here to worship you. That we put aside the the things of this world and the earth and the problems and, and the things that, that distract us and we're able to praise you openly and publicly without shame, embarrassment. We thank you, Lord, that you have caused us a heart to praise you. And now as we, we continue let us lift our voices with thankfulness, knowing that you are a wonderful, holy, and righteous, and just, and merciful God. In Christ name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Let's turn to our hymn book to number 429. 429. Oh, we are Christians.
but we are so grateful. We are so grateful to have this audience. We are so grateful to have the one who sees all things and knows all things to be able to come before you. And Lord, today, as we gather in your name to worship you, we come before you to ask that you would bless. Bless that you would open our hearts to receive what you have to say. Bless that you would help us to understand the words and the meanings. Bless that you would help us to apply to our lives for servanthood. That we may serve you every day. And that is the blessed life. That is the life filled with joy. That is the life filled with the purpose for which we were saved. Help us to understand. Help us to love you more for what you've done. Through Christ and in his name, we pray. Amen. 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 It is certainly great to be back with you again in the pulpit. Uh, even though we were here each week while Josh was here, it was, it was nice to have a few weeks that we didn't have to prepare. Um, and it was a treat for Chrissy and I to have our son fill in during those, those weeks and, and share with all of us. Uh, today we're going to be taking a break from our Roman study to relate to you what's been going on in, in our lives. You know, it's, it's always cool to, in, in hindsight to see after the fact what how the Lord works. You know, originally we thought, okay, you know, Josh is in between jobs and he's always looking for pulpit supply experience and being able to, to get some time in to preach. He, he gets to preach about every six weeks in his church. If, if that, sometimes it's longer. Um, so we thought it would be a great experience for him, and we thought, you know what, we'll get a little downtime. We'll, Chrissy just retired, and maybe we'll go get to, you know, take a few day trips and relax a little bit. And, um, but, you know, the Lord had different plans. Uh, we had two funerals, uh, family members that passed, um, that we had to travel for. One of them I officiated. And it's always a, a challenge when you have a, a week where you plan for funerals and, and have to do your, your regular Sunday work too. So the Lord knew that and, and He gave grace in that regard. Um, a verse that popped into my head as I was thinking of that is Proverbs 16. I love this verse. I'm sure you know it too. A man's heart devises his way, but the Lord directs his steps. So we, we make plans, and that's okay. The Lord lets us do that. But we never know what the Lord's got in store along the way. Amen? Uh, another kind of interesting story that goes along with that, just to kind of show you how far this verse goes. Um, Christy and I, this last week, we went down to Sanibel. I'd never actually gone to Sanibel before. Been in that area many times, Pine Island. Um, but uh, we enjoyed a few days with Josh and his family. So we were there from Monday to Thursday. And um, on the last day when we packed up and left, um, got everything in the car and Josh headed out the parking lot first and then we followed him. And we didn't get very far, maybe half a mile. And I said, oh, and said, what's the matter? I said, um, I left the gun in the room. Whoa, my night, no matter. <laughs> so, um, I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's maturity or, or just God's grace. Um, things happen out of the ordinary. Usually, don't don't bother me too much. I just kind of matter of factly turned around and went back. I wasn't panicking. I wasn't driving fast. I, I just you know I started heading back that way to see if we could go on up to the room and get it. It was real close to checkout time, and I didn't know if the locks were going to reset because you do it by a lockbox and, and they do that remotely. So. I didn't, I didn't know if we were going to have to go through the extra process of doing all that. But I wasn't worried. I mean, we weren't gone that long. 
So we get back there, and uh, I stayed in the car, and Chrissy ran up to the room. Well, just as she's coming to the room, another family comes and meets her. Melody had befriended another girl that was her age that week, and uh, her name was Violet, was it? And uh, man, they really hit it off. And as it turned out, every time we would make plans to do something, without even knowing it, their family had made the same plans. So we were meeting each other throughout the week. We went on the dolphin cruise together, we met at the pool together. Um, so we got to talk to them quite a bit. You know, they knew, they found out we were pastors and we were there, we were from Orlando, blah, blah, blah. They were from Minnesota. Well, they had come up to say their final goodbyes. We didn't know it. And they brought a party gift for us. So had we not made that little error, we would have never gotten to have that last uh, uh, time together. And they, they connected with one another and they're going to stay in touch. And when we were young, it was pen pals. Now it's social media and they, they get to talk to each other directly. So that was really cool. Um, the rest of what we're, we happened over the four weeks will be in the message. So I'm going to move on. All right, let's set the stage today for what's going on here in Luke chapter 12. The scene occurs near the end of our Lord's Galilean ministry. And uh, in human terms, you would say by this point, Jesus has obtained rock star status. I mean, it, it says in verse 1 of chapter 12, you want to look back there. It says, in the meantime, there were gathered together an innumerable multitude of people. Thousands of people had come out to, to hear Jesus. Um, he had been preaching and healing and doing miracles now for some time, and the word has gotten out. People, people are coming from all over to hear and see Jesus. Uh, furthermore, he has attracted the attention of the religious leaders uh, who view him as a threat to their power, their money, um, and their importance, and they're opposing him at every turn with all their ability. They're lying about Jesus, they argue with him, uh, they're doing everything to turn the people against Jesus. Um, and there, But yet there are still people whose minds are not made up. They haven't gone with the Pharisees yet, and they haven't gone with Jesus yet. They're just kind of following along and trying to take in the information and, 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 and make sense of, of all this. And that's who he's addressing. If you look on down further in verse 12, it says, um, after it says there were gathered an innumerable amount of people, insomuch as they trode one upon another, he began to say unto his disciples, that's those people. Now these are not believers that are committed and have been converted. We know that from John chapter 6, because a lot of these people um, leave after John 6 and don't follow them anymore. But we're not going to go into much detail about that. But just know that these people are open-minded. They're, they're, they're following for right now to, to take it all in. So he's, he's uh, targeting those folks. The title in your Bible probably has this parable listed as the rich fool. MacArthur likes to call it uh, the doom of the materialist. And I think that, that hits a little bit better for where Jesus is going with all this. So we're looking at the, the parable of the doom of the materialist. <clears throat> if these disciples are going to be saved, Jesus' point here in this passage is they've got to avoid two things that's going to derail that goal. Two things. And he starts out, those two things come under the heading of the word beware. The first one is found in verse 1. After it says he began to say unto his disciples, he says, first of all, beware ye the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. That's the first one. And the second one is in our text, down in verse 15. It says, and he said unto them, take heed and beware of covetousness. Now at first glance, 
It might, it might appear like, well, okay, Jesus has just pulled two random sins out of a bucket, you know, two that everybody would recognize, and he's talking about these two different sins. But it, as we investigate and look into this passage a little bit more, you're going to see that Jesus is actually identifying the two essential realms of reality. One is the material, and the other is the immaterial. One is the spiritual, and one is the physical. One is the natural, and one is the supernatural. Each of these represent the greatest influence from each of those realms that can damn the soul. Both realms are under the control of Satan. The spiritual realm, Satan is the prince of the power of the air. He is in charge of the demon forces that are here all around us. Now when I say he's in charge, obviously the Bible says that God's greater and can overrule Satan at any time, but he allows Satan to run things here, both in the spiritual realm and in the physical. He's the God of this world, 2 Corinthians 4 tells us. So these two influences are real pitfalls. They are very deceiving. Bible says has a lot to say about both of these and while here they are defined separately they are many times blended together practically we know in the case of the Pharisees they were causing all the problems here the Pharisees were lovers of money the Bible says that clear not only were they false teachers pushing a false religion, they liked money. They liked what it could afford them. And it's so different in our culture today. The false teachers are the ones that are the most greedy. They're the ones that are always talking about money. They're the crap flow dollars of the world that says, I need a private jet and y'all need to give it to me. He said that. The Kenneth Copelands of the world, the Benny Hens of the world. Benny Hens with his personally monogrammed suits that he wears. I got a big kick out of those. False religion in the spiritual and money in the physical are tied together, they're linked. These two come to a pinnacle. Later on in our passage, if you look on, uh, at the very last verse again, the scripture combines them. So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. So money is a deterrent from actually coming to know and serve the living God. At the outset today, I just want to throw this out there, uh, and I'm preaching to the choir here, but you know we live in a culture today that is littered with the masses of unbridled wealth. Never in the history of the world have we lived in a time where the world is so wealthy. We have stuff everywhere. Stuff. We have stuff on stuff. We have stuff holding stuff. Well, I don't know about you, when I was a kid, we had all the houses, if you were fortunate enough to live in a house, I didn't. I lived in a house trailer. I lived in a mobile home. But if you lived in a house, 90% of all houses built didn't have garages. They had something we used to call carports. Remember that? That's how houses were built. It wasn't until recently that houses came with garages. Back when I was a kid, only the most affluent houses had garages. And usually then they were detached garages. They built them like But now we have garages everywhere. And even people that live in mobile homes today have storage sheds and barns. Got stuff everywhere. And also when I was a kid, we didn't have these public storage units. Now it seems like every spare corner that you have in every city, what's going on up there? I don't know. Come back by a week later, it's a public storage unit. We need more places to put our stuff, right? 
No wonder I don't have one. I don't know if you do. I hope I'm not stepping on your toe. I'm, I'm wondering what kind of stuff you put in these things. I mean, how often do you go to these places? If you put it in there and haven't gone back there for two years, do you really need it? <laughs> I mean, really? We have a lot of stuff. Whatever you have, whatever I have in this life is only in this life. If it's material, it belongs to this life and this world. It stays here. It has no real value. It has no enduring value. It's just something that's temporary while we're here. And James says that you're only here for a vapor. You're only here for a very short time. So all that effort that we put into all this stuff that we have here is just for a little, <coughs> little bit. And then think about all the all the credit cards that buy all that stuff that we put in the storage units that we never go back and visit. And we got a real problem today in America, especially with recession and inflation. People are maxing out their credit cards left and right. We're having a huge problem with with debt, with prices going through the roof, and it's only going to get worse. They tell us anyway for the time being. So we live in a unique time. So I don't talk a lot about money. I, I don't feel like I need to um, because of my, we've always had to, such a giving church. And I think people have a pretty good handle about money. This, this is really about me more than it is you. So if the shoe fits, you can wear it with me. Um, but this is, these are some things that Christy and I have learned on our vacation. Call it that. We called it that. It was a good. It was a good month. It really was. Money and stuff is not immoral in itself. It's amoral. It's 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 immaterial. It's not good or bad. To have stuff is not wrong. It's how you think about it and what you do with it that can be a potential. Harm. It can be a trap. But stuff presents choices. The more stuff you have, the more choices you have. And that's really what the parable is about. This guy ended up with a lot of stuff and he had some choices to make. What am I going to do with it? What am I going to do with it? Verse 76 warns us about some of the pitfalls of stuff. It says, but godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. Having food and raiment, let us be there with content. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil. Which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith, pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But thou, O man, flee these things, and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and meekness. And in the same chapter, uh, down in verse 17, it says, Charge them, this is Paul talking to Timothy, Charge them that are rich in the world, that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy, that they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute willingly to communicate, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come, and that they may lay hold on eternal life. So let's, let's start with our text and start to work through it, and I'm going to make a few comments at the end. Verse 13, our text says, and one of the company said unto him, Master, speak to my brother that he divide the inheritance with me. This is really funny if you think about it. Because Jesus is preaching. If you go back and look at the beginning of this chapter, Jesus is preaching some heavy stuff. He's preaching judgment. He's preaching heaven and hell. He's preaching um, that you need to believe in him. He's preaching the ministry of the Holy Spirit. So all this stuff is going on. This is very important, very 
high stuff. And all of a sudden, a guy in the crowd, he's, he's waiting for Jesus to take a breath so he can, he can ask him something. He actually doesn't ask him. He commands him. If you look at it the way it's written. And he just blurts it out. This is one of those kind of guys that, you know, have you ever been in an audience and somebody just blurts out something, you know, so that they can hear it on stage? Why does somebody do that? You do that because you think you're speaking for the crowd. You, you do that because you think everybody is in agreement with where you're at. So what he's basically just told everybody in the crowd is, all those really high-minded spiritual things that are coming at us right now, I have a very practical question, very down-to-earth question that has nothing to do with any of that. Actually, I'm not interested in any of that. What I'm interested in is getting my money. And you can help me with that, Jesus, because you're a master. And master here is rabbi. And we might think that this is a really out-of-place thing for this guy to say at this point. But actually... In that culture, that's one, of the, that's one of the duties of a rabbi. A rabbi was an arbiter of people that had disputes. And you could go, before you went to a magistrate, you could basically go to arbitration, which is just a spiritual representative. And he would give his point of view. He would make the decision. And um, that's what he's doing here. Now, we don't know any of the facts about this is he the older brother? Is he the younger brother? Uh, is the other brother doing something unseemly? Uh, we don't know. We don't know anything about that. But it doesn't matter. Because Jesus takes it this way. In verse 14, he said to him, Man, who made me judge or a divider over you? Man? What's, what's interesting here, I mean, we, we might think that that's kind of odd, actually, the way he says it, uh, but it's not. For him to say man, it's, it's like for us to say mister. Mister, I got nothing to do with you. That's what he said. I got nothing to do with you. What he's saying by the word mister or man is a term of distance. In other words, he, he didn't call him child of Abraham. He didn't call him uh, my dear, uh, you know, precious servant or my disciple. Any number of things he could have addressed him at. He addressed him as mister. No mister. That's a term of, I don't really know you. I don't really have anything to do with you. And then his answer goes on to say, when he says, who made me judge or divider over you? We know that God the Father made Jesus judge over all things, right? Amen? So why does he say this here? Because his things that he's going to judge are the all-important eternal things. When you show up in heaven, either at the beam of seat of Christ or at the great white throne judgment, you're going to be judged on the things that are going to determine your eternal future. Your right relationship to God through Jesus Christ or your refusal to accept Jesus Christ where you've trampled on the gospel. That's the important thing. He doesn't care how much stuff you have or who it belongs to now or belong to then. Or when you get to the, the eternal throne room, all that stuff is forgotten. It's all going to be burned up. So he doesn't care to arbitrate this foolish little trivial thing. That makes sense? But then he goes on. <laughs> He's got a lot more to say. Verse 15, he starts with the beware, take heed, beware of covetousness. The word used here is mark, observe, guard. Every form of greed. The word is actually a very strong word. It's a desire, a grasping, an extorting, a scheming for riches. It's all that you think about is money. It consumes your mind. Money. Again, the sin is not having stuff. The sin is being discontent. The sin is not having wealth. The sin is what you do with it. It's not the amount. It's the attitude. 
Lots of rich men in the Bible. Godly men. Abraham. Job. Solomon. In the New Testament. Joseph of Arimathea. A lot of the New Testament churches were held in people's houses. Big enough for a crowd. Rich people. A lot of people in Acts came and gave abundant money so that the church... So being rich is not a sin. Having stuff is not a sin. But to worship it, scheme for it, be discontent about it, think about it all the time, above everything else, that is, as Romans 1.25 puts it, to worship the creature rather than the creator. And here's why Jesus goes on to explain. Take heed of beware of covetousness, for a man's life consists of not in the abundance of the things which he possesses. Interesting, that word life there is, is there's two words of life for life in the New Testament, bios and zoe. Bios is physical life. It's the biology of life. Zoe is the, the purpose of life, the, the meaning of life. And here in this context, it's eternal life. That's the life Jesus is talking about. So that life, that <laughs> eternal purpose life in Christ, has nothing to do with your possessions. That's what he says here. Nothing at all. So basically... <laughs> You can kind of almost see the guy in the crowd and he's probably kind of shrinking down right now. Because Jesus has been preaching about eternal life and how to get it, how to know it, and the warnings of not having it. And then this man blurts this thing out and he says, look, what I've been preaching about has nothing to do with possession. But then he goes on. He doesn't stop there. This is where it gets good. Verse 16, he's fake parable unto him, saying, The ground of a search, certain rich man brought forth plenty. No crime here. The farmer. He had a bumper crop. He had a lot of fruit that year. Honest well. Hard worker. Went out, worked the ground, and boom. Look at all we've got here. Nothing wrong with that at all. What's, what's really odd, you know, I don't, I don't know about you, but I haven't met many farmers that are not believers in God. I just haven't. I, I, I almost think they go hand in glove. You know, it, a farmer, you know, Josh pointed it out, a farmer can only do so much. He works hard, but he has to, at some point, give it over to God. Or nature, or evolution, or, or whatever, or weather, or mother earth or whatever he's going to give it over to because he can't make that thing grow he can't make the crop happen amen so most farmers I know are believers they believe in God they believe they, they, they do what they do by faith hoping that there's going to be a crop there's going to be a harvest but not this guy he's an exception Verse 17, he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, because I have no room where to bestow my fruits? Even here, he still hasn't done anything wrong. But we're starting to get a, 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 a peak that there is something on the horizon that's not exactly right. There's nothing wrong for a farmer to have a bumper crop and go, Wow, what am I going to do with this? It's okay to ask that question. Stuff gives you more choices. And now he's got choices to make. What am I going to do with this bumper crop of stuff? But then he goes on in verse 18 and 19. But I'm going to read it together. And he said, this will I do. I will pull down my barns. I will build greater. And there will I bestow my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat and drink, and be merry. He 
even in his answer, we can hear a real problem. Eight eyes and four mys. It's all about me, 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 me. I, I, I. And we see the solution that he comes up with. The solution that he comes up with. First of all, let's talk about what the Christian would do with this situation. Just as a, an antithesis to what's going on here. You get blessed with a, a bountiful harvest. You, you have an abundance. Well, you have all kinds of servants that helped that happen. People that have been working out there, laboring for you, working hard to, to make, he didn't do all that himself. He didn't plant, drive the tractor, plow, do the watering, all that. He had people that helped, lots of people. If there's this much, and it sounds like there's a, an awful lot here, there's a lot of people that went into that. How about a bonus for those folks? Number one, treat your employees well. Bless them. Bless them for helping you be blessed. Number two, he lives in a city. He's either got a synagogue and a temple or just a synagogue. God gets his cut, first fruits, right off the top. In this day and age, it was under the old Mosaic law, he gets 10%. Then there's offerings on top of that. It was a bountiful crop. So the Old Testament says tithes and offerings. If you got above and beyond, what are you supposed to do? You're supposed to give above and beyond. And the Old Testament says you got the poor and the widows. You got all kinds of folks that would really benefit from this. Support those folks. And you got friends, neighbors, relatives that could also benefit. Community activities that could benefit. Charities. Lots of great things that you can do with a bountiful crop. Amen? Not this guy. This guy is so selfish and so self-focused that he's not even going to go and plow under some of his land to build bigger barns. What is he going to do? He's going to tear down the barns that are there on land that's not producing crops. And he's going to build bigger barns, higher barns, so it doesn't take up any more space. He's not going to destroy some of his harvest and some of his crops and some of his future investment. No, he's going to expand these that are already there. And notice that it's not just for his fruit. It's all his goods. He's got more stuff. You know, this is the only place in the Bible where it talks about storing goods. Every other place it talks about storing fruits, storing grains. This is the only guy in the Bible who has stuff he's got to store. Interesting fact. He forgot others. He forgot God. And he's having this whole conversation with himself. It might even be a little bit um, watered down, even if he just said, I will say to my wife, wife, this is what I'm thinking about doing. Or to my family, family, this is what I'm thinking about doing. But no, it's all him, for him, by him, through him, to him, for all things. That's this guy. It's just about him. The last thing he forgot, besides God and others, is he forgot his own mortality. So then we get to see the big surprise in verse 20. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? James 4.13 tells us and warns us, Go to now, ye that say, today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city, continue there, continue there a year, buy and sell and get gain, whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. For you ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. Everything should be tendered by the Lord will. And this pleased the Lord. We make our plans, but they don't exclude the Lord. Amen? 
everything includes the world. So he's going to die. And verse 21 says, So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. He's going to show up at the throne of God and have nothing to show. Nothing to show. You never notice a um, hearse to pull, I mean, that uh, the casket rides in. They don't have trailer hitches. No U hauls towing behind. You can't take it with you. You can't take it with you. Unless you send it on ahead, it won't be there. You can't take it with you. I think it's pretty straightforward. So what do we take away from this? Uh, this is where the three hours comes in, but I'm going to try to cut it down to ten minutes. I'm going to do my best. Um, first, you know, I've shared with you all in the past. I'm not going to go into detail about this. Um, I didn't come from money. Um, I, I grew up in a mobile home. My parents were working parents. Um, they, both, uh, they both worked. But they didn't save, they didn't have any retirement. Uh, my father passed a couple years ago and uh, he didn't have anything to leave. I got his golf clubs, his used golf clubs, and I gave those to Kendall. And I don't begrudge my father for that. Don't, I'm not saying that. I love my father. Um, but that's, he didn't have anything. And uh, that's, that, that, was, that was my model. Uh, growing up, and that's the way my life started out. I, I can remember being a young married, 25 years old, and working hard and trying to figure out whether to pay the light bill or the phone bill, which one's most important. You know, I'll, I'll pay one and call the other one and ask them if I can have some leeway on that. Just working to get by. And um, you know that the uh, the Lord blessed us with some great opportunities, and uh, hopefully we were wise. With with those um, uh, opportunities that we were given. I remember every morning as I was working through uh, the last four or five years, I would start with a prayer. Um, first, I would quote Job, uh, naked I came into the world, and naked I shall return. Uh, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I love that verse. My, that, that verse is my mantra. Hold it loosely. Basically, is the idea. Stuff is not wrong, but don't treasure stuff. Don't hold on to it so tightly. So the Lord gave us some opportunities. And by the way, I, I just want to add this. Uh, I'm not in the market right now. I'm mostly out. Um, for the next six months to a year is a very volatile, volatile time to be. Uh, and if y'all have 401ks, I might suggest you put some of that in a settlement fund or a money market account. Uh, things don't look good in the near future. So I'm, I'm not continuing to push forward. And I'm glad. I want to take a break for a while. I really do. Get it off my mind. Get it off my head. Um, but that's the, that's the opportunity the Lord gave us, and that's where we are today. So, most of you know that Chrissy just retired just recently, 37 years as a teacher. But as you might imagine, when somebody's been doing something for 37 years, at the end of that, you kind of look around and go, okay, what do you do But y'all know Chrissy's heart, and you know her nature, and she's not going to be sitting around eating bonbons or just playing pickleball all day. Nothing wrong with pickleball either. She's going to serve the Lord, and she's going to grow, and she's going to be involved uh, with our church and with her family. Uh, the reason I had the call to worship read this morning, this, this guy here is most likely a lost man. We read about our text this morning, but Jonah wasn't. Jonah was a saved man, and the Lord gave him something, he prospered him, get him out of the sun, and then he took it away. And what was Jonah's response? Anger. He wasn't grateful 
And then and he didn't quote Job and say, Lord, give, Lord, take away, bless me in the name of the Lord. He, he was angry about that. He had the wrong attitude. Right? So, what, the second weekend of our vacation, we all know that I gave Chrissy a bike for her retirement. Pretty nice bike. Picked it out because, you know, this is something we thought we'd do, you know, in her retirement. I also bought one for myself and a nice uh, rack for it to go on the truck. So we went on two or three rides, really nice ride. They had some great trails around this area, great trails. So we, we were going on our fourth ride on the cross, no, the Wakaiwa, what's it called? Wakaiwa, Seminole Wakaiwa Trail. In order to get there, you have to go over the Lake Jesse Bridge. So we rack everything up, load it up, get all ready to go, and we're heading that way. And we get to the Lake Jessup Bridge and about the, the second the dunk, I said we just lost a bike. So Chrissy looks out the window and she's expecting to see a bike tumbling down the road behind us and the car is going like this on the bridge, you know, and she doesn't see that. Well, I should have been a little bit clearer, but I was just kind of in shock at what just happened, so that's all that came out of my mouth. So I knew what had happened, not what happened, but that it was not actually gone off the back, that it was actually dragging behind the back. Because one side of your wheel is locked in. It can't come out. Um, so I, I knew what was going on. And, and that bridge is, I don't know, four or five miles long. It's a long bridge. Nothing I could do. Traffic coming both ways. I'm just going. <laughs> get to the other side of the bridge and pull off. And then I, I went around behind and uh, I, I, I want to start this by saying this is one of the most wonderful days Chrissy and I have had together in a long time. It was. So this is how it started. <laughs> and so we, we got out together, you know, cars, I mean, no shoulder, get out, trucks were going by, blowing us. Get out, go around right behind, and the bike is there. It's being drugged behind the car for the last four months. And, uh, you know, the handlebars are ground to nothing, the seat's all messed up, and, 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 you know, we don't know how bad the damage is at this point. So we put it back on, and we kind of check everything, and, and we start heading to um, where we bought it. We bought it at REI and went apart. We didn't go back across the bridge, we went on around uh, <laughs> to come back to Winter Park. Anyway, we got there and we go in and you know and you're you're trial, trailing this thing through the, the lobby and everybody's looking at but we weren't on that thing. Right? <laughs> so we get over there and they they're like, Okay, you need to do one of these, you need to do one of these, you need to do one of these. And you know with the amount of money that you pay for the bike, you're thinking, okay, he's going to change he got all done and he said, okay, all that's going to be about $80. And we kind of looked at each other and we went, wow, praise the Lord. That's pretty cool. And then come to find out, um, we just weren't putting it in the rack properly. One little alteration and we haven't had that problem since. It was just one little thing with how this rack works. Uh, the way we had it, it so when it bounced, it could actually pop up out. But the new way they taught us, you do it, that can never happen again. It's foolproof. So the whole time, you know, we're we're talking, and um, I was telling her about this sermon that I was going to do. This sermon was prepared before that, <coughs> and the rest of the day we rode around and talked about this sermon. And she was sharing personal things from her life and the things that she was feeling and, and the fact that she wants to serve God and honor Him with her life. She doesn't want to just, you know, be like this guy, eat, drink, and be merry. I don't want to be a retired and party here yet. That's not her goal. That's not her focus. So we talked about this and we talked about that and we just had the most wonderful day together. And that's we shared and we learned from each other that day about how our, what our attitude towards money is going to be going forward. We um, we are committed. We, we want to bless others with what the Lord's blessed us with. We want to enjoy 
what the Lord has given us. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, we want to continue to grow in grace. We want to, you know, Josh pointed this out, and that's why I brought this today. He, he talked about who one of his favorite authors is C.S. Lewis. Remember that? And I was over in his house about a month ago. I didn't have anything to do. We were watching the girls. So, you know, Christy played on the floor with the girls. What am I going to do? I'm going to go over and pick up a book. <laughs> so, um, so, let me read you. I just opened the book to the middle. This, this one actually has six novels in it. And this one comes from Mere Christianity. And I opened it to this section. The section is called uh, Counting the Cost. I never expected to be a saint. I only wanted to be a decent, ordinary chap. <laughs> When we come to Christ, a lot of times we think, okay, Jesus saved me from my sins, and he got those really big ones out of the way. And I don't have to deal with those anymore. I'm not a, I'm not a drunk anymore. I'm not a druggie anymore. I don't kill people anymore. I don't rob banks anymore. And, you know, I'm feeling pretty good about myself. And now I just kind of like to settle into that, you know, go to church every Sunday and have a few fellowship times and enjoy my family and just, you know, really enjoy this Christian life thing. The problem with that is, Jesus is not going to stop with that. Jesus said, be perfect, as my Father in Heaven is perfect. And He is not going to stop that process until you show up at the pearly gates. He is going to continue to prune and cut and pull and yank and, and move and convict until He gets every sin out of your life. And he's going to do whatever it takes to make that happen in your life. And he's got all kinds of things. It may be a bone knee. It may be a thorn in the flesh. It may be an eye problem. It may be an ear problem. It may be a foot problem. He's going to make you think and work. He also goes on to say this. That is why we must not be surprised if we are in for a rough time. When a man turns to Christ and seems to be getting on pretty well, in the sense that some of his bad habits are now corrected, he often feels that it would be natural if things went fairly smoothly. When troubles came along, illnesses, money troubles, new kinds of temptations, he's disappointed. These things, he feels, might have been necessary to rouse him and make him repent in the bad old days, but why now? Because God is forcing him on and up to a higher level, putting him into situations where he will have to be very much braver or more patient or more loving than he ever dreamed he could be before. It seems to all of us unnecessary, but that is because we have not yet had the slightest notion of the tremendous thing he intends to make us. Jesus also points this out in our text, but later on down, if you look down at verse uh, 34, it says, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Let your loins be girded about and your lights burning. And ye yourselves like unto men that wait for the Lord. God's not opposed to our happiness. But he's also not doing everything he can to make our lives happy. That's not what he's about. He's about making our lives holy. And about giving us a purpose to serve Him. We have a job to do. And we have a path to walk. And that's the most important thing. And that's what our goal needs to be. That's what our focus needs to be every day. And that's what we talked about. That day. That was the wonderful day we had. Let's pray. <coughs> Heavenly Father, thank you for the privilege the privilege of serving you. Thank you for the periodic things that you give us to uh, make us comfortable or make us cool. We thank you for those blessings along the way. But we also thank you for the purpose and the privilege and the reminders every day that we're not home yet. That this is not intended to be perfect and happy here. That's what heaven's for. 
this is the mission field. This is where we are ambassadors for you. This is where we serve the King and learn and grow in His grace. Help us, Lord, to every day be mindful of that fact. As we share and bless others and give and help one another towards that goal. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to have a song of invitation. The Lord deal with you this morning. We invite you to come and stand together and sing. I would be pretty sad.